to your Excellency, our distinguished guests, Excellencies. Uh, I will speak in Lithuanian now. So, Labadiena, Gerbiami Svečiai, studentai, bendromenės nariai, šiandien mes turim labai įdomų svečią, labai garbingą svečią Islandijos prezidentą. Ir tai simboliška, kad jis atvyko būtent šią dieną, kada mes pradam švesti, kaip aš šiandien pasakiau, naujo Lietuvos šimtmečio pradžią. Mes kaip universitetas turim žiūrėti į ateitį. Ir labai džiugu, kad šiandien, kai yra tokia šventinė nuotaika ir kai visas universitetas švenčia, kad svečias atvyksta ne iš bet kur, o iš Islandijos. Tai yra iš šalies, kuri labai svarbi Lietuvai. Šalies, kuri pirmoji pripažino mūsų nepriklausomybę prieš 26 metus. Ir šalis, su kuria mes tikimės ir ateityje plėtosim labai gerus santykius. Šiandien ten jau gyvena apie vieną procentą lietuvių. Ir mes tikimės, kad tai tėtie bent vienas procentas Islandų atsikels į Lietuvą taip pat. Tai aš ilgai neužimsiu, to pačiu visu sveikinu ir dabar suteiksiu žodį jo ekscelencijai, kuris, manau, pateiks jums labai įdomą paskaitą apie Lietuvos ir Islandijos santykius, nes jis pats, pasirodo dar 94 metais, rašė magistro darbą apie Lietuvą ir jis yra iš tikro vienas iš Lietuvos ekspertų Islandijai. Taip kad žodis jo ekscelencijai, jo ekscelencijai, please take the floor. Thank you. Rektor. Excellencies, dear guests, what a pleasure it is to be here today. What a pleasure it is to be here in Lithuania on this uh, joyous occasion when the people of Lithuania celebrate uh, the fact that uh, 100 years will have passed uh, tomorrow from the restoration of uh, Lithuanian station, uh, statehood. So I am pleased to be here and to bring you the greetings of the people of Iceland. Now, the topic of my talk is close to my heart. Uh, Iceland's uh, support for Lithuanian independence. We could start in 1918, uh, but allow me to take you back to uh, the dark days of January 1991. Many of you may be too young to remember those days, but others will. Uh, we are here in Vilnius, and on the night of the 13th of January, a Soviet crackdown has begun. There are tanks on the streets. There are special units on the streets, the TV tower is surrounded and attacked. Parliament is surrounded. Uh, what is going to happen next? Who will come to the rescue? Vitautas uh, Landsbergis, uh, the leader at the time of the Lithuanian independence movement, recalled that during that fateful night, he had first tried to contact Mikhail Gorbachev in Moscow, that failed. And the next thing he did was to try to contact leaders in the West. And he told uh, the Lithuanian representative in Oslo, try to reach the foreign minister of Iceland, uh, Hanne Balson. Try to tell him that we are in need of assistance. Now, why Iceland? That is a story I will go through with you uh, here today. Uh, Icelandic states persons and officials had already begun to support the Baltic struggle for independence in the late 1980s, 1990, up to January 91. And that night and the following uh, days, uh, 
Hannibalsson and other uh, ministers in Iceland received a simple message uh, as they later recounted, as Hannibal's recounted, Hannibalsson recounted. He said the message from Landsbergis was clear. If you have meant anything with your words so far, come over here, come to Vilnius, stand with us at the barricades. Now, this caused some problems. If you wanted to travel to Lithuania in January 1991, how would you get here? You needed a visa. You needed a Soviet visa. So this was a diplomatic uh, obstacle. But the Icelanders felt, Hannibalsson felt, uh, necessity breaks the law, as an Icelandic saying goes. So he went to the Soviet embassy in, in Reykjavik, applied for a Soviet visa, and a Soviet visa he did get, uh, visited the Holy Baltic States uh, in the, on the 19th till the 21st of January, uh, witnessed the scenes here in Vilnius, also in Riga, also in Tallinn, and at a big, huge press conference here in Vilnius, Hannibalsson proudly declared that Iceland will consider very carefully establishing diplomatic relations with Lithuania, which was really what the Lithuanian uh, leadership wanted at the time. He said, to great applause, yes, the Icelandic government will carefully consider establishing diplomatic relations with Lithuania. Then he went home, debates in parliament and within the government followed, and on the 11th of February 1991, the Icelandic parliament resolved uh, that Iceland uh, had not rescinded uh, the recognition of independence given in 1922, that Iceland considered, still considered Lithuania to be an independent state, and that diplomatic relations would be established as soon as possible. And then weeks and months followed. And let me take you now to the days of August 1991. Again, for some of you, this is maybe alive in your memories. For others, it's just a part of history. But on the 19th of August, I was actually working, it was my summer job then, as a reporter in Icelandic State Radio. And uh, on the morning of the 19th of August, you come to work. Is there anything in the news? And the guy on the night shift said, nah, Gorbachev has been removed. <laughs> it was a putsch attempt in Moscow on the, on the 19th of August, 1991. Chaos, instability, what happens next? For leaders of the independence movements in the Baltic countries, it was a window of opportunity, as they said. And they called on leaders in the West to immediately recognize the new situation, recognize the independence of the Baltic states. Foreign Minister Hannibalsson, still in power, there had been a regime change in the spring in Iceland, but he was still foreign minister. He was at a meeting of NATO foreign ministers in Brussels. He had a written speech with him. But as he later recounted, he said, well, I did away with that. And I told my colleagues, my other NATO foreign, or the other NATO foreign ministers, it's now or never. Let us take bold steps towards uh, the recognition of the independence of the Baltic states. He enjoyed full support also uh, from uh, the other uh, leader of the government, it was a two-party coalition, Prime Minister David Otson. But there were murmurs in the Western camp. Are we not going too fast? Let us consider what happens next in Moscow. Let's be cautious. But there was a sort of a race for recognition, especially in the Nordic region. The Icelanders wanted to support the Baltic cause. So did the Danes, so did the Norwegians, and the Finns, and the Swedes, but maybe in a slightly different fashion. But there was a kind of a race between Iceland and Denmark. Who would be first? We can easily admit that. It's led by Hannibalsson in Iceland and by Uffe Elman Jensen of Denmark. 
They were forceful characters, and they wanted to demonstrate their sympathy for the Baltic cause. So, Hannibal sent the message to, to the Baltic capitals, yes, we are ready to establish diplomatic relations with the, with the Baltic countries. Come to Reykjavik, Iceland, and we will sign declarations to this effect. And these messages were met with joy and pleasure. Yes, we're on our way, the uh, Baltic leaders said. And uh, Vitautas Landsbergis, still in the forefront, sent a message to Jón Baldwin Hannibalsson, and it went like this. I cannot quote it from heart, uh, but he said, I always believed that Iceland would be the first, and this is finally happening. In January, the first time that the Soviet putsch choked on the blood of unarmed combatants, your unforgettable visit to Vilnius inspired hope in the people of Lithuania that someone in the West was not neglecting them. And now, larger countries have resolved to follow Iceland. I press your hand so hard as if having once again eaten a piece of Icelandic shark meat. Landsberg, he said, because he had been on a visit to Iceland. We had given him a piece of shark to sort of taste Icelandic delicacies. So, on August 26th, the foreign ministers of the Baltic countries, uh, Algirdas Saudargas, uh, Janis Jurkans, and Lennart Meri, arrived in Iceland and signed treaties on the resumption of diplomatic relations between uh, Iceland and the Baltic countries. So, Iceland was the icebreaker on the international scene, they said in Reykjavik. Nobody did so much for us, was also the message. Thank you, Iceland. And there is an Iceland street here in Vilnius, as you know. I, I was, uh, they showed me the courtesy of driving through Iceland street this morning. And uh, every year you have the Thank You Iceland uh, ceremony. And this pleases us to no end. And we really, we really, really uh, feel the warmth and the gratitude. And it is, of course, nice. It is, of course, nice to be praised like this. But do we deserve it completely? In the summer of 1990, a US diplomat went up to Foreign Minister Hannibalsson of one, after one of his speeches about the need to support the Baltic cause. And you know, this is when the Cold War is coming to an end. There is German unification, there is disarmament, there is the need to have stability and control of the situation. You have George Bush in, in Washington, you have Helmut Kohl in Germany, you have Gorbachev in Moscow. We're trying to end the Cold War in a peaceful, respectful and organized manner. And what's the problem with these Balts? Can't they realize that they must not rock the boat? We must do this in an orderly fashion. That was the message, general message in the West. And there we had people like Elleman Jensen of Denmark and Hannibalsson of Iceland saying, do not forget the Balts. Do not forget the Lithuanians, the Latvians and the Estonians. And this US diplomat came up to Hannibalsson and said, wow, gee, what a privilege what a privilege it must be to represent a small nation and be able to say whatever you like, because it doesn't matter. Wow, and it was meant as a compliment. Also, also, uh, and I welcome the Finnish uh, ambassador here. I remember the words of Mauno uh, Koivisto, who said, because the Finns, they were more cautious and Koivisto answered a question to that effect. Why are you more cautious than the Icelanders? And Koivisto replied, in a strong Finnish accent, well, we are not an island in the middle of the North Atlantic. <laughs> Geography plays a role here, as I will come back to later. And also, in the end, Iceland established diplomatic relations with the uh, Baltic countries, Denmark as well, the other Nordic countries, and so on and so forth. The US was a bit late, only taking this step uh, in the first days of September uh, 1991. And President Bush was asked by a reporter, uh, why was you, the US so late in this? Why, why uh, did you not uh, take this step immediately, just like uh, you know, other countries? 
And Bush replied, uh, when history is written, nobody is going to remember that we took 48 hours more than Iceland or whoever else it was. <laughs> now, how do I know all this? Uh, I am now president, but previously I was a historian teaching history at the University of Iceland and absolutely loved it. I will go back to that profession someday. As president, it's almost written in your job description that you must be optimistic, you must be positive, you must be sort of a symbol of unity, uh, gracious, and not so critical. As an academic, it is written in your job description to be critical, to doubt everything, never believe first or think first, well, what does the Icelandic state want me to say? How can I convey a positive image of Iceland? So it can be, it can be a bit difficult to move from academia to being head of state. I'm just warning you here, if somebody have, has this, these aspirations, it's a tricky, it's a tricky, uh, it's a tricky road. Academics, historians, political scientists, they need to attack myths. Myths of history, for instance. The myths that uh, states persons and the state is tempted to create about the country's history and the country's present. I came to Lithuania for the first time in the summer of 1994. Uh, a backstory to that, that I was, at that time, 1993, 94, I was a student of history. I was doing a master's uh, degree at the University of Iceland. And I needed to write a course essay, a course essay on contemporary history. And I felt, well, I was really interested in, in, the, uh, in the end of the Soviet Union, the, the end of the Cold War, collapse of the Soviet Union, and in particular how Iceland was active on the international scene in the Baltic course. So why not do a course history, course essay on this? So uh, I got a, a positive reply from my supervisor and uh, then I felt, okay, I'm gonna seek an interview with uh, Foreign Minister Hannibalsson, just get, get his thoughts on this. Just a short interview. I got that, went to the Foreign Ministry for this 15, 20 minutes interview about Iceland's support for Baltic independence Four hours later, <laughs> I had all the information I, I had asked for and more than that. And just in the end, I knew, like I'm a historian, I said, you know, well, I know the archives are closed for 20, 30 years, if not more, but is there any chance of seeing something? And Hannibalson just on the spot, ah, you can see everything. I'll just, you know, we'll make exception. This is such a, an important part of Icelandic history. So I, I was given access to all the foreign ministry archives and then this, course essay just ballooned into a master's thesis. Stuðningur Íslands við sjálfstæðis baráttu Eistrasallslandana. I was always going to write an English version, but uh, never got around to it. But maybe one day you will get to see the English version. The students can translate it, yes. <laughs> Here's a job assignment. <laughs> anyway, that involved, I wanted to interview participants. So I went to, I wasn't unfortunately unable to go to Latvia, but I visited Estonia, and in the summer of 1994, I came here to Vilnius. So I was here uh, on the 17th of June, 1994, on the 50th anniversary of the independence of Iceland, because Iceland became a republic on the 17th of June, 1994. Uh, that day, was probably one of the most joyous days in Icelandic history, 17th of June, 1944. Those days, those years, the war years, were times of horror for Lithuania. And uh, I was struck by those differences. My fellow Icelanders on the 17th of June, 1994, were celebrating 50 years of independence. Here I was in Vilnius, interviewing Landsbergis and others about the uh, re-establishment of 
independence after decades of Soviet oppression and uh, various crimes committed. So, uh, for Lithuania, the warriors were the time when the country lost its independence. We could go back further. We could go back to 1918. Uh, on the 16th of February, 1918, when Lithuania uh, became an independent state or declared independence, Iceland was still part of the Danish kingdom. And it was a bitterly, bitterly cold day, 16th of February, 1918. I've checked it in, in Iceland. But later that year, Iceland became also a sovereign state. On the 1st of December, 1918, Iceland became a sovereign state. We still had a royal union with Denmark. The Danish king was still sovereign, but, and, and the Danes handled our foreign affairs. But to all intents and purposes, Iceland had become a sovereign state. And we conducted, uh, we took main decisions in foreign affairs. For instance, uh, deciding in 1922 to recognize the new state of Lithuania and uh, Latvia and Estonia as well. So that's where we also began our journey towards independence, just like you did. But then our paths diverged completely. In Iceland, democracy survived the interwar year, years. Democracy did not survive in Lithuania. For Iceland, the Second World War, despite some losses of life at sea, it was a good war for Icelanders. Years of prosperity, years of independence. In Lithuania, years of horror and the loss of independence. We can also take another year to, to compare Iceland and Lithuania. 1953, uh, around the time when uh, armed uh, campaign against Soviet forces comes to an end, the end of the Forest Brothers here in Lithuania, or thereabouts, 1953. 1953 in Iceland, for instance, the time when we signed a very extensive and lucrative trade agreement with the Soviet Union with the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union became a very important trading partner for Iceland. Even though Iceland was a member of NATO and we had US forces on the island, we did extensive trade with the Soviet Union. And how did that affect Iceland's relations with the Baltic countries? Well, in 1958, for instance, a delegation of Icelandic members of parliament visited what they called the Soviet Republic of Latvia. They would have gone to the Soviet Republic of Lithuania had they been invited. In 1978, the Icelandic ambassador in Moscow went on a visit, official visit, to the Soviet Baltic Republics. And he just stated, stated it's nonsense to treat the Baltic states as anything else than belonging to the Soviet Union. We have extensive economic interests here, Icelandic ships sail to the Baltic ports, and we, to all intents and purposes, recognize the Baltic countries as belonging to the Soviet Union. Not de jure, though, not legally. Iceland never backed down on the recognition of Baltic independence in 1922, never formally accepted the Soviet annexation of 1940. But to all other intents and purposes, Icelandic politicians and statespersons and diplomats recognized the actual state of affairs. But let's not forget that the Icelanders sympathized with the Baltic uh, plight. I remember very well, I was fascinating as a, fascinated as a kid with geography and flags. Uh, I, I am not boasting, but I knew practically every flag as a kid. It's just something, I was, I was a shy kid, I, you know, you, <laughs> you just do these things. I, I could remember, I could uh, put all flags together with the country of origin. And I remember these three vanished flags, these vanished countries. Countries you could look up in old atlases, but are no longer there anymore. Flags that could no longer be flown. And we had books, we had books, translations of uh, stories by Baltic emigres, for instance, describing the Soviet yoke. One of them translated by David Otson, prime minister in, in 1991. So, so there was no lack of sympathy for the Baltic cause. 
But when it came to economic interests and the real state of affairs, you just had to take the situation as it was. So we can sum up the post-war situation of Iceland in, in this description. Uh, in 1966, Hungarian refugees sent a letter to the Icelandic government asking the Icelandic government to commemorate and condemn the Soviet invasion of Hungary 10 years before. So lest we forget was what they said. This was accepted and received in Iceland, but the then prime minister wrote back to the Hungarians, and you can just put Lithuanians instead of Hungarians, just to get the same feeling as it were. And he wrote, the vast majority of the Icelandic people has from the very outset had the deepest feeling of sympathy for the struggle for freedom of the Hungarians, or, you know, compare Lithuanians, and for their fate. Iceland, on the other hand, is a small country and devoid of power. As a consequence, care has always been taken on the part of the Icelandic government not to mix in the affairs of others by the issuance of declarations or by some other means which could not be followed through. It would serve no one if this rule were to be broken now. That was the message. We sympathize with you, but there is nothing we can do. We have to accept the state of affairs as it is. And that was the situation in the late 1980s when the Baltic struggle for independence really began. The singing revolution, the uh, denunciation of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact in 1989, the chain from the coast of Estonia to the border in the south of Lithuania and Poland. Sympathy, but what can we do? Well, on the 11th of March 1990, the newly elected Seimas, the Lithuanian parliament, uh, voted to declare independence, asking other states to recognize this new state of affairs. There was again sympathy in Iceland, and the parliament in Iceland sent a letter of congratulations, but not the next step, not the next step of, uh, of uh, diplomatic uh, relations. So then, as I described to you, there was the visit in January 91 and the steps in August 91 after the putsch to resume diplomatic relations. But this time, this time in 91, from January to August, was a time of some disappointment here in Lithuania because expectations had been raised. Yes, you are going to resume diplomatic relations. You are going to send diplomats here or establish an embassy. The Lithuanian parliament said, we, we can give you a building for an embassy. You can, we can do it now. But that step was not taken. And you also have to consider, I am not saying the Icelandic government was moved by economic interests, but there was always the risk that, uh, there was always the, risk that uh, the Soviet Union would somehow retaliate. Uh, the Soviet Union was in a state of chaos in, in early 91, but we still had extensive uh, trade interests in the Soviet Union. So, the desired step of resuming diplomatic relations was not taken in February, March, April, and so on, uh, of 91. And some Lithuanian politicians got a bit disappointed, even though they would not say so uh, publicly. So we have to keep that in mind as well. But we also have to keep in mind that the story ended on a happy note. Nobody has done so much for us, Iceland, icebreaker on the international scene, and so on and so forth. So we have to ask ourselves, and I am reaching the conclusion of my, my talk here, did Icelandic support matter at all? And if so, how? And now you must remember what I said about being president and being an academic. I have written about this as an academic, and maybe I was a bit more critical then. You know, you can just Google that. But here's my take on this as president. Yes, it did matter, and I said so as well before. Moral support did matter, indirectly. People here, people in Estonia, people in Latvia, the Estonians and the Latvians and the Lithuanians felt, well, at least there is someone who is willing to talk about our plight in Western circles. There's somebody who has not forgotten us, and this gave a moral boost. And there was indirect pressure in the Western world, within NATO, within the UN, in Nordic circles. 
Whenever people spoke about the joyous end of the Cold War, there would be a hand raised by the Nordic representatives, the Icelandic foreign minister, the Danish foreign minister, etc. Let's not forget the Baltic states. You cannot speak about the end of the Cold War unless the Baltic states have regained their independence. So this mattered as well. But Iceland did not free the Baltic states from Soviet yoke. We are not that powerful. And I think Foreign Minister Hannibalson summed it up nicely when he said once, and uh, I just quote him here, I wish also to pay tribute to my Danish colleague, Mr. Uffe Elman Jensen, who joined me early on in this effort and proved to be an, eff an effective champion for our cause. I have no wish to exaggerate our influence. It was certainly not within our power to turn around the ship of NATO or change its course single-handedly. We were merely foreign ministers of small nations. But we could let our voice be heard, and we had our vote. We were listened to respectfully, and we prepared the ground for the reaping of the harvest later in the fullness of time. So this indirect support uh, did matter. And therefore, I can easily, uh, without embarrassment, uh, accept the gratitude I feel when I come to Vilnius and uh, uh, listen to the, the uh, expressions of, of joy and gratitude here. I remember in 94, when I came here as a poor student, I was not even allowed to pay for my beer when people, uh, told, uh, when people heard that I was from Iceland, because such was the support uh, for the Icelandic cause then. Now, what now? Lithuania regained its independence became a member of the UN, member of NATO, member of the European Union, achieved freedom on the road to prosperity. Uh, what next? There are always challenges ahead. I know, for instance, that in the last decade or so, uh, more than 10% of the population has decided to uh, move abroad. In the short term, in the long term, we do not know. But there is a feeling here that you can seek better fortunes elsewhere. We, of course, in Iceland also experience this, but we always like to think that the majority of Icelanders moving abroad come back because we have something to offer them. And that must surely be the goal here in Lithuania as well, that young Lithuanians seeking employment, seeking education, seeking adventure abroad will aspire to come back and have the opportunities to contribute further to Lithuanian society. And we like to help. We like to help creating a good future for Lithuania. We are not perfect, far from it. We Icelanders, we are also in need of learning from others. But maybe there are a few factors where we can be of assistance. Uh, earlier today, I visited the uh, European Institute for Gender Equality, uh, based here in Vilnius, a European Union Institute. Uh, we Icelanders are known in the outside world for uh, uh, strides, big strides on the road to gender equality. And again, we are happy to listen to this applause. It makes us feel nice, makes us proud to be Icelandic. But at the same time, we must be careful not to let it go to our heads. There are always, there's always room for further improvement. And we are not there yet, uh, as Prime Minister Katrin Jakobsdóttir described it, uh, yes, we have achieved many things on the road to gender equality and situation in Iceland yeah, may be better than in many other places. But if we are to achieve gender equality in terms of prime ministers, then the next 39 prime ministers will have to be female, for instance. But she was not saying that would be the right measurement of this, just to demonstrate that it's not a perfect gender equal society in which we live in Iceland. But if you want information of how we have traveled down this road towards gender equality, we are happy to give you all the information you want. Another aspect, helping children in trouble. Uh, there is a charity here in Vilnius, here in Lithuania, Help the Street Children, striving to help children, for instance, through uh, after-school activities, sports. And we have, we have a, 
we have made progress there in Iceland, uh, striving to make it practically free for kids to, to practice in sports or after school activities. And maybe this is something you can, in all humility, learn from us. Uh, a way to help kids achieve uh, their potential, their dreams, strive to be happier. What, what can be a loftier aim in politics or in society than to create a good future for the children? So the first activity uh, of the project is to arrange a high-level roundtable uh, at the end of February, at the end of February this year, uh, where Icelandic story of, of uh, football accessibility for kids uh, will be presented. Because we've, we've, we have this campaign to, uh, to uh, get kids involved in football and other sports, of course. And, uh, well, speaking of football, <laughs> speaking of football and small nations making it big on the international scene, uh, you may know that the Icelandic men's football team made it to the World Cup finals uh, in Russia this summer and uh, smallest nation ever on that stage. So, uh, and one reason, one reason for the team's success is the fact that, that they respect every opponent but they fear no one and there is a team spirit. Nobody's bigger than the team and that's why they've made it this far. And if you, if you need a team to support in Russia this summer, you know where to look for, I hope. And the women's team, the women's team already beat the men's team to, to making it to a big final. They've made it to the European finals and hopefully, hopefully they will also make it to the World Cup women's finals in, in France uh, next year. So this is the future of Icelandic-Lithuanian relations. Uh, you guys will support us in Russia. We will also support you in whatever way we can. But to return briefly to the past as well. Uh, in Lithuania, just like in Iceland, history and history education contains myths, uh, state-sponsored narratives, which the historians like to refute or uh, criticize. And there is no single version of the past. No single version of the past. But in the long run, no nation is well served by creating a false or exaggerated image of its achievements. No nation is well served by ignoring its failures or misdeeds. Uh, that, would my, that would be my uh, take on history as an academic, but also as head of state. Now, I need to conclude. I will try to do so in your beautiful but totally incomprehensible language. Asnoriu patekoti jums Lietuvai uz žilta priemima. Sveikinu jūsų Lietuvos nepriklausomybės jubileumi ir linkiu visio kerjopus šekmes atetie. Thank you. Thank you very much for such an uh, insightful and uh, um, very uh, powerful speech and, and talk on, on, uh, on this uh, occasion. Let me introduce myself. My name is uh, Lutar Vazgojinskas. I am Associate Professor at the Institute of International Relations and Political Science. And actually in 2016, December 16, uh, 16 uh, there has been a conference uh, on the occasion of uh, commemoration of reestablishment diplomatic relation between Lithuania and Nordic countries and the president was uh, the main uh, trigger to, to organize that conference. 
uh, Nordic scholars from, from, from every Nordic country, as well as uh, Lithuanian researchers from various universities participated in that conference. And I perfectly recall your welcoming speech made via multimedia, where when you said that, yeah, you as a student came and, and, uh, and studied that uh, particular uh, uh, historical uh, move of Iceland to recognize Lithuania. So, in a, in a sense, one could say that yeah, this lecture, this talk was somehow a continuation and, 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 and your participation at academic life here at Vilnius University. Uh, we have a very good friend, Harry Balson, who was also lecturing at, at Vilnius University. And uh, so it's very great that we have uh, um, uh, you as also contributing to, to, to the academic discussion here. Um, I would like, uh, so I am, my, my role here is moderator. I have also some, some, some uh, questions to, 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 uh, to you, but uh, I don't know, maybe from the audience already you have some reactions and commentaries. <laughs> Thank you for this question. Uh, Iceland is a small country. We have embassies in the Nordic countries, in uh, Washington DC, in uh, Berlin, Paris, etc., Ottawa, Canada. I cannot recall them all, but uh, it is uh, unfortunately beyond our means to have embassies as widely spread as bigger nations. We are well served, uh, we believe, also by uh, having uh, uh, ambassadors taking care of in our interests in other countries. Just like uh, in Iceland, uh, there are not that many embassies, but still we maintain good relations with countries all over the world. Maybe, maybe, uh, when we get richer, we will establish an embassy here. <laughs> okay, uh, here, uh, Member of Parliament, yeah. Zingeris. <laughs> much. Well, people in the Nordic region often speak of the Nordic model. Uh, what is the Nordic model? 
It is uh, this combination of individual freedom and societal responsibility. We uh, like to see people able to uh, live their dreams and aspirations, seek to excel if they want to in the fields of education, arts, uh, business, if they want to become rich, but at the same time contribute to society. And if you need assistance from others, you will get that assistance. There will be a safety net. You will not be just left to your own devices. So there is this combination of individual freedom and societal responsibility. And what does individual freedom entail? It entails freedom of expression, freedom of religion, freedom to love, freedom to love whomever you want. And, <laughs> yes, you can... Yeah, well, <laughs> and the willingness to pay your taxes, <laughs> the willingness to contribute. Yes, that can be more difficult, yes. But there is this combination of individual freedom and a safety net from society. I could go on about this, but in a nutshell, this is what the Nordic model is about and should be about. Also, inclusivity. What constitutes a Nordic person? How do you define an Icelander? Is it by the color of her or his skin? No, far from it. Is it by what God he or she uh, believes in? Far from it. It is an adherence to our universal values and our legal system. Then you are welcome. Okay. Uh, maybe some other questions? Uh, we have here also many students, both from pro political science and also. Yeah. Here. Uh, while recognizing the failure on the international level, well, you mentioned that Iceland had some uh, trade uh, with the Soviet Union, some extensive trade deals, and were you not afraid to lose your future trade deals? And Yes, this was actually uh, discussed in Iceland, and there were some politicians and some uh, business persons who criticized the Icelandic government for moving too fast, for endangering Icelandic interests. And stern words could be heard from the Soviet ambassador in Reykjavik, warning Icelandic society, uh, Icelandic authorities, that uh, trade interests might be put at risk. But such was the chaos in the Soviet Union at the time that the right hand did not know what the left hand was doing. So at the same time that the Soviet ambassador was threatening Iceland in Reykjavik. A trade agreement was signed in Moscow between Iceland and the Soviet Union at the end of January 1991, which also demonstrates that while Icelandic statespersons were determined to support the Baltic cause, at the same time they were willing to uh, protect and advance Iceland's economic interests by making a trade agreement with the Soviet Union. Uh, Iceland was in the forefront when it came to vocal support for Baltic independence. But I think I am correct in saying that at the time of the collapse of the Soviet Union, Iceland was the only state or among very few states which had, which was, uh, which had all its payments made by the Soviet Union, had, had no debts to collect in the Soviet Union. They treated us so well, the Soviets, in this regard, even though we were so vocal in support of the Baltic cause. There is a contradiction there. I would have loved to look more at. Uh, but uh, uh, to come back to your question, 
there was concern in Icelandic circles that, so, uh, the, that economic interests, uh, trade with the Soviet Union, would be harmed. Uh, I, I have a very related short question. Uh, so, uh, uh, having in mind these possible threats, uh, have been there discussions in the parliament when there has been this decision made and have been, were there some opponents of this uh, Lithuania's recognition in the parliament or, 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 or was uh, the vote and uh, was rather unanimous? Well, on the 11th of February 1991, the Icelandic parliament resolved to uh, reiterate that the uh, recognition of Lithuania uh, independence of Lithuania from 1922 was uh, fully valid and diplomatic relations would be established as soon as possible. Uh, there was one vote against it. And there was an MP, a rather eccentric person, who said that these are just empty words. Iceland doesn't count in this matter. I am not willing to s sign something that is just empty words. And, you know, he was true to his convictions. The Prime Minister at the time, he decided to abstain. He also said, I see no need to reiterate something that is clear to everyone, sort of going almost in this direction. So while there, were no, uh, uh, there was no uh, strong force against it, it was not completely unanimous. I think we need to keep that in mind, actually. Okay. Uh, but still, quite unanimous as such. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, University on the first year in Parliament, uh, reaching Reykjavik with a note inside of President Lambert's note asking the Chamber of who is actually not bigger than small in this room, uh, Chamber of uh, Islamic uh, Parliament, and uh, it was the first, first clear statement immediately to stop the violence against uh, 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 attacks of uh, KGB brigades against TV Tower. And the first statement was done with tears in their eyes. The first statement. So you're talking about Nordic values. I think you can add sincerity to the values. The Nordic are sincere. They do, you are absolutely, you are very balanced in your uh, describing the 1990, but 1991, but being there as you in Reykjavik, I would like to say that it was emotional, full, total support for Baltic uh, uh, coming back to the big freedom and free world, and total support of your nation, and inside the parliament, in the chapel, I saw tears. What you are, it's, you are Nordic. But the tears are power too. So thank you for your sincerity. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Yes, well, I cannot, of course, uh, give you a definite answer. My guess would be that Icelanders see Lithuania as a northern European country. Uh, if you look at the uh, Nordic region, you can see that some countries have something in common, whereas others do not. Uh, the Norwegians and the Swedes and the Danes can uh, more or less understand each other. We and the Finns have sometimes trouble understanding them, 
we are not uh, that close to them uh, linguistically, uh, in particular the Finns, of course, uh, uh, and there are other dissimilarities within this group. Uh, I think there are around 3,000 uh, Lithuanians living in Iceland now, and you may think that's not that much, but it's almost 1% of the population. Uh, and they are uh, generally seen in a positive light, hard-working people. I remember I taught some Lithuanians, and excellent students they were. Uh, whether, uh, whether the Icelanders see Lithuania as a Nordic country would depend on the definition of Nordic. And when we look at the Nordic model, we can also see it as a as, as an export, just like, just like IKEA. We can export IKEA, we can also export the Nordic model. So let us create, when, with this favorite uh, image of the Nordic model, let's just, just create Nordic models everywhere. Let's make the world Nordic. <laughs> Yes, please. Uh, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, it was certainly not a cunning plan on my behalf. <laughs> I was a associate professor of history, very happy in that position. Was just about to become. Full, full tenured professor, the last step on the ladder, when uh, all the stars on the horizon aligned in this position, creating this question I had to face, if you want to, you can probably become president of your country. Would you like to do so, yes or no? This was the question I was faced with in the spring of 2016, and I figured that since this opportunity arose, it would be nice to try shaping history instead of just writing about it. <laughs> yes, maybe some other questions. Uh, okay, maybe I, then I will uh, jump with my one question. So uh, you mentioned Nordic values and especially like that you said that have the right to love what you want and uh, also tax collection as 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 important uh, responsibility of every citizen. Uh, despite that, as you mentioned, that president should be progressive, very optimistic, forward-looking and so on. Uh, but also they should assess threats or some uh, dangers uh, to, the, to, the, to the status quo, to the, the, the current system. So what are the main threats to these Nordic values in this uh, changing world? world? Course, yes. yes, let's make some caveats. <laughs> you know, let's make the world Nordic. How can that be seen as arrogant? Of course it can be in a sense. The Nordic world is not a perfect world. Uh, far from it, but the ideals are there, so that is what I would like to convey. We can call it something else, we can call it a model of individual freedom and societal responsibility and everyone should be happy. Uh, in Scandinavia, for instance, and in Finland as well, but to a rather less degree in Iceland, immigration has created tension and dissent. Uh, tension and dissent, which needs to be resolved. Uh, I do not have any clear-cut answers. Uh, and you must also recall that as head of state, I am not in a position similar to that of a president in France or the US <laughs> with everyday political powers. The president of Iceland is a symbol of unity, uh, a position which entails, to be sure, uh, political powers, the power to uh, refuse to sign laws passed by parliament, for instance, so that they will be uh, put before the nation in a referendum, 
the presidency also involves uh, a, a, an influential role when it comes to forming governments, although the politicians uh, lead the way there. The president can sort of have a guiding role. And incidentally, uh, within my uh, uh, fields of expertise as a historian, the presidency was one of my fields of expertise. And within, within that field, my subfield was the role of the president when it came to forming governments. And since I took office in the summer of 2016, we have had two cabinet crises. Twice we've had to form a new government. So for me, as an academic interested in this aspect of the presidency, it's almost like stepping into your favorite TV program. I'm just like <laughs> taking part in what I had been describing before. So uh, uh, those are the caveats I would like to mention when, when this question comes up. The Nordic model is far from perfect and there are challenges and obstacles to be uh, faced there by the political establishment, by society in general. But as president, I am optimistic. I am also, as an individual, optimistic by nature. So I am sure that we will find the right balance between maintaining uh, and strengthening Nordic values and also uh, giving refuge to those who need uh, to escape from the horrors of wars and poverty, we cannot isolate ourselves from the troubles of the outside world. There's nothing Nordic about that. There's nothing humane about that. So striking the right balance is the, is the right way to move forward. Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe some, some additional questions, commentaries. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you watch um, the TV series by Marcus Akonma, who I mean, is attacked, yeah. um, they have one of not, not the main character, but one of the uh, important characters, is a little woman, uh, who is involved in some mafia. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, work, and then the Robin Ferguson, I think, also is a team. Some novels were the Romans, I mentioned. Action of one of But perhaps there are some cultural phenomena which depict the Lithuanian Icelandic traditions in a little bit more positive light, or do you think that it's worth the part of the Again, I would not be the expert. But there was a sad case in Iceland uh, a few years ago, which caught the attention of the whole population. Uh, attempted smuggling of drugs to Iceland, where uh, people from Lithuania were involved. And the sad truth is that you cannot escape the fact that the criminals involved were persons from Lithuania. Uh, let me reiterate, however, that the automatic assumptions of Icelanders do not include a general view of Lithuanians, therefore, as drug smugglers. There are Icelanders all over the world, good persons, not so good persons. And please, I would hope that when Icelanders commit crimes in other countries, the people in those countries do not automatically assume that those unfortunate people who have committed crimes do not to represent the whole population. So the, uh, the incidents in Trapped, I am sure, uh, is based on this sad reality, uh, but it stops there. This is not how Icelanders perceive Lithuanians. Uh, if we want to take a more positive image of Lithuanians, it's, you know, your brilliance in basketball, for instance, is something we remember rather. I can recite from watching the NBA, Arvita Sabonis, for instance. That would be my Lithuanian idol. So, uh, so uh, you know, it depends on what you look at. Again, it's not, it's not the general image of Lithuanians in Iceland, even though it runs into a TV series.
And uh, you know, we at our department, we are uh, used to say that in Lithuania it would sound so that we are uh, the Scandinavian Vietnam. We think we make Lithuania more Scandinavian. <laughs> we think it's good for Lithuania. And we like your motto, let's make the world more modern. But you, you see here many young faces. What would you like? It's, it's a pleasure to listen and to, to, to hear the strength in all what you are doing and seeing. Uh, do you have something to wish the young people? Something? Well, I, I, am, I am an old man. <laughs> I look at the youth and see all the dreams and aspirations and possibilities. Well, I mean, uh, sometimes I think, you know, wouldn't it just be better to be a historian, an academic, and not to be asked questions like this, a, as good question as it is. But my advice would just be to um, try to follow your dreams and uh, be willing to put in the effort necessary do the homework. Don't appear at seminars without having read the assignments. <laughs> yes, that would be my message to the youth of Lithuania. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, we have more or less five minutes still, so some last chances to, to ask questions. But be critical. <laughs> be critical in your studies. Don't, don't uh, treat us academics, I, I will just say that, us academics as the, as the bearers of the ultimate wisdom. Uh, well, don't be annoying though, uh, <laughs> but always keep in mind the need to be critical and the need to question, the need to doubt, because that is the key to knowledge, the key to development, the key to progress, because otherwise it's just stagnation and backwardness. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I want to come back to your knowledge of changing the seats from writing and history to the history of the one. And it of course may happen that you, you will be in a position in a situation where you need to make a decision like, like your colleagues, uh, politicians, management. Uh, it seems we're in a world where, where reality will take you back, and, and it matters if you're a big country or a small country. How do you see the role of small countries like Iceland or Lithuania in this world? I mean, the, do we still matter? Mm -hmm. Yes, we do still matter, and uh, we can be a force for good. Of course, real politics will always play a role, especially maybe for small nations. You have, to, you have to look after your own interests because if you do not do it, who else will? But for small nations it is imperative that we uh, maintain and strengthen the rule of law uh, in the international arena, respect for international law, respect for international agreements, because if force is the defining factor in international relations, we are in trouble. Our defense depends on uh, the respect for, like I said, international law, the respect for the independence of, of states, respect for borders, and uh, it is our, in our deepest self-interest to uh, to be on the right side when it comes to these uh, issues. Uh, then it is up to each state to define what is in its best interests. Lithuania gained it in, regained its in independence in 1991, and what were the first steps desired? Yes, enter the UN, enter NATO, enter the European Union. Now, in Iceland, there has never been uh, a majority, a steady majority for joining the European Union because it is seen as a curtailment of independence in the uh, world of states and nations by the majority, by the steady majority. 
So why, you may ask, why was it a desired step by a country that had just regained its independence to join the European Union, while in another small country like Iceland, that step is seen as, as, a, as a curtailment of independence by a steady majority. Uh, there is no one size fits all when it comes to independence and sovereignty and state interests. But the general overarching theme is respect for international law, respect for international agreements, respect for borders, and then uh, we will have a safe and secure future. Okay. Yes. Uh, I know that uh, you are also a sports fan. Yes. Yeah, but, therefore, uh, my question would be maybe uh, may look not very serious. <laughs> it's serious, of course, question. We, 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 as you know, we are not very good in football, but Iceland's phenomena actually made something amazing and believe, unbelievable. And of course, you will have for this game in school, and even the incoming uh, uh, games in Russia. But please share with us, because how Iceland did that, how Iceland became this you know, football number one in the world, I would say so. Because we want to learn how to play football, how to make this happen in great things. You know. Well, let's make a deal then. You tell us how you are so amazingly good in basketball, <laughs> and we tell you the secret for footballing success. On a more serious note, uh, as historians, we always need to remember the importance of chance. About 10 years ago, we were ranking very low in, in the table of footballing nations. We lost 3-0 to Liechtenstein. <laughs> now we are number 18 on the, on the list and making, uh, have made it to the World Cup. We just have to remember that nothing can be taken for granted in this, but the background also is that uh, in Iceland, coaching is taken pretty seriously at youth level. I see this with my kids. The coaches in football and other sports have taken their courses, they have gotten their football coach badges or, or in other sports, so they are, they are well educated. And everyone gets a chance. Uh, the, the town councils subsidize participation in sports, and this matters. And I always you, you're right, I am a sports fan. I use most opportunities when it comes to sports to emphasize that at the youth level, it is a question of participation, allowing everyone to take part. Because then you have a bigger pool. Then you can see uh, who, who will actually develop into a professional footballer or a professional gymnast or whatever. But allowing everyone to take part, not only for sporting success, but to create a good or to help create a good individual with respect for teamwork, uh, with respect for others, and with respect for oneself. That is the purpose of sports and other leisure activities which we should uh, enhance. So, you know, I cannot give you the secret, uh, but this is one part of it. And uh, then we just must hope that we will do well in, in Russia, uh, and I'm counting, I'm counting on the support of Lithuanians when it comes to those good games. Uh, yeah, it seems that uh, democracy, inclusiveness is also important in sport as, is, as in, is in public life. Uh, I think uh, our time is uh, already uh, run, so I would like to thank you, thank the you. President. Uh, of this.